With all the news in robotics that's coming out right now, it might be easy to miss this. But as you're about to see, this might be the most important of them all. It's called Mobile Aloha. Here's the big headline. You can build something like this for your house, for your business, for your garage, for about $32,000. It comes with a data set that allows it to do some commonplace tasks, but you can teach it to do pretty much whatever else you want by basically strapping yourself into it and walking you through how to do that task. This is showing that the future of robotics won't be built behind closed doors by massive organizations completely locked away and hidden from the world. Instead, it will be fairly inexpensive, easy for the average person to utilize and train and customize to their own needs. And also just from a safety perspective, I don't know, I would feel pretty safe with that thing rolling around my house. In case it goes rogue, I would just walk upstairs. In this video, let's talk about what this thing is, what it can do, and why it's not that far-fetched that you might have something like this in your house, potentially even this year if you're a early adopter. In fact, if you have 32,000 to spare, you can start building one right now. now. Let's take a look at Mobile Aloha, learning by manual mobile manipulation with low cost, whole body teleoperation. Did you read that as teleportation? Because I did at first and I was very confused. And so were a lot of people because, and let's get this out of the way right now, a lot of these actions are referred to as autonomous. And it's important to understand what, what specifically I was saying, because this isn't a fully autonomous robot. It's a robot that's trained with teleoperation. So I think a lot of people are confused. Is it doing all of this by itself or is there a human being controlling it? Well, it's in between. Let's take a look. So when you're looking at this robot cooking this meal, cutting up the veggies, stirring the eggs, cracking the eggs, that is done with teleoperation. That's kind of like this thing right here. There's somebody that's strapped in there that's training the robot how to do it. The robot is mimicking those actions. So is it just a remote controlled toy? Well, not exactly, because they are learning and generalizing how to do things from being teleoperated. Here's Jim Fan saying, what did I tell you a few days ago? 2024 is the year of robotics. Mobile Aloha is an open source robot hardware that can do dexterous bimanual tasks like cooking a meal with human teleoperation. Very soon, hardware will no longer bottleneck us on the quest for human level, generally capable robots. The brain will be. So this work is done by three researchers with academic budgets. What an incredible job. Stanford rocks. All right, so here's the paper, Mobile Aloha, January 2024, just came out, and it's Stanford AI department by the three people we mentioned earlier. And so the important thing to mention here and to understand that this whole system costs $32,000, including onboard power and compute. So on the left here is we have a user that teleoperates to obtain food from the fridge. So this person is basically moving their hands. The robot is mim mimicking those hand movements to complete the task. Teleoperation, so distance, operating at a distance. And on the right, we're showing that mobile Aloha can perform complex long horizon tasks with imitation learning. And imitation learning from human demonstrations has shown impressive performance in robotics. So in this work, they developed a system for imitating mobile manipulation tasks that are bimanual. So where you need two hands and you require whole body control. So for example, if you're cooking, you got a pan in one hand, you got one of those spatulas in the other, you're whisking the eggs or whatever. That's hard to do because it requires two claws or hands or some sort of robotic appendages to work together and kind of coordinate their movements together. That's been very difficult. The solution that they're demonstrating here is imitation learning. So first they present Mobile Aloha. It's a low cost and whole body operation system for data collection. And using the data collected with Mobile Aloha, they're able to perform supervised behavior cloning and find that co-training with existing static Aloha data sets boosts performance on mobile manipulation tasks. So in other words, it sort of quote unquote watching humans do it or imitating how they do it. It learns how to do it much more effectively than without the human demonstrations. So the human demonstrator goes through a number of demonstrations, repetitions, where they show the robot how to do something. This is the data collection, right? So for example, one of them is wipe wine. So it looks like for the wipe wine, there was 50 demos, demonstrations by humans. And then afterwards, this is what they've labeled as the autonomous result of doing that. So the robot goes, picks up the towel, 
turns around, and now he has to lift the wine with one hand, and then wipe the area underneath with the other. So again, this was done 50 times by a human, and the data was gathered by the, the robot. So, and through imitation learning, it is able to sort of approximate how to do that on its own. So I guess a good way of thinking this is like a macro. If you have a macro on your computer, that kind of repeats certain actions that you're able to, or like a mouse recorder, you move the mouse around the screen, you click on things, and the computer kind of like replays those actions. This is in a way similar to that, but much more robust and much more general in the sense that the robot, for example, the location is randomized where the various objects are placed are slightly randomized. So it's able to generalize a little bit. So it doesn't repeat the actions exactly inch by inch identical to how it was trained, but rather it's able to generalize a little bit. So if the towel that's sitting there on the kitchen sink is slightly askew, it'll still figure out how to pick it up. If the glass is, you know, off to the side a little bit, it'll figure out how to pick it up. And the big breakthrough here is how inexpensive it is to start creating stuff like that to collect the data, to start teaching the robot how to do these tasks through imitation learning. They were also able to cook shrimp with 20 demos by humans, use cabinets, rinse a pan called the elevator, push chairs in, and high five people. So for example, for the one where they're pushing the chairs in, so the robot's initial position is, is randomized a little bit, and it goes in and pushes, as you can see, one, two, and three chairs, and it continues to push in the rest of them for a total of five. Now the demonstration data set contains pushing in the first three chairs, and the robot is tested with all five chairs. And that's where I think a lot of the confusion came in, because it's not a fully autonomous robot that just knows how to do everything out of the gate. You can't just tell it, go push all those chairs in, it just knows what that is. But it's also not like a remote controlled helicopter that each move it makes is controlled by a remote, by somebody pushing a button somewhere. It's somewhere in between. You can you start by controlling each of its movements and you showed how to do a task multiple times. It learns kind of, it generalizes a little bit how to do that task and it sort of re replays it. But it's able to adapt a little bit here and there, which if you think about it, a lot of tasks can be automated with something like this. The biggest dilemma for me in the mornings is to get out of bed, I need coffee. And to get coffee, I need to get out of bed. Good news is I'm sure this thing can be taught to operate a curing machine, which gives me hope for my future. One thing that I found very interesting is how the how the cameras are placed. Where would you place the cameras on this thing and how many? Here they placed three. The top egocentric camera, so like the head, kind of like where our vision would be. And you also have the left wrist camera and the right wrist camera. The top camera is stationary with respect to the robot frame. And the wrist cameras are attached to the arms, providing close-up views of the gripper in action. Here's kind of what that looks like. So as you can see here, this is how it goes and wipes up the spill from the wine, right? So on the left-hand side, you see it's sort of face camera, it's head camera, or egocentric camera, as they call it. And then you have the left and the right gripper. So here it's approaching the sink, it's seeing the towel, and it's grasping the very edge of the towel here. Now it's approaching a glass, so here's the gripper that's going to grab the stem of the glass, and here's the one that's holding the towel. Now you can see it's doing something, right? But up close we can see, okay, it got the stem of the glass, and it looks like it already wiped it up, and it set the glass on top of the towel to wipe the bottom of it sets the glass back down and moves away. I mean, here's an example of it being tele-operated. So it's cleaning the bathroom. So the person is using the little handheld controls to do everything. And everything is recorded by the computer through the three cameras, through the motion of the arms, and that data is stored. And then it's used to train it to imitate that behavior. So for example, you, you know, go through and you clean the bathroom 50 times or whatever, and it learns to do that for itself. So to me, this is very exciting for a number of reasons. One, it's impressive how inexpensive it is to build something like this. Certainly, I was surprised to see that the total amount is 32,000. The software, the data set, the hardware code, the learning code, it's all available, available right here. So here's the tutorial for how to use it. It's shared with everybody and it describes the bill of materials for how much it would cost to build something like this. Various arms and connectors and onboard compute, the camera setup, the power, the wheels. And I love the fact that they have like the rubber bands and the gripping tape on here. You would need to bring your own Allen keys and a hot glue gun. I like this because it shows you that this is in fact how much it costs. It's not like they forgot a bunch of stuff that's going to skyrocket the cost. I mean, they have everything listed here to the penny. Interestingly, they also have some 3D printed parts. By the way, if you're a smart kid that's listening to this and you're thinking about where do you want to go in life, what do you want to do, I don't want to give you any recommendations, but 
a lot of this seems really exciting. And this is what Dr. Jim Fan is saying. He's saying advice for aspiring PhD students, embrace robotics, less crowded, more impactful. And if you think about what fully autonomous robots, humanoid robots capable of doing most of the physical labor that humans can do as they become more capable and less expensive, you have to think about what that does for the world's output. Right now, our labor, how much we can get done is constrained by, you know, how many humans we have that are capable of doing that work, how many hours they're awake in a day, et cetera. If we're able to, in any number of years, create something like this that can work around the clock, completing a lot of these tasks, that kind of breaks a lot of the stuff that we haven't really thought about. How does the GDP, the gross domestic product, how does that look? What happens when labor becomes unlimited? It's a very interesting question, and we are rapidly, seemingly rapidly approaching that robotic explosion. If you've been following the work of Dr. Jim Fan, we've covered a few of his things on the channel. So one of the most exciting things is this Eureka, which shows that something like GPT-4, a large language model, can, you know, let's say teach robots in a simulation how to do certain things. In this case, for example, how to twirl a pen in their fingers. The recent breakthroughs from Google DeepMind is showing robots that are able to do a lot of things autonomously. They have a general ability to do a very wide variety of tasks. They can understand instructions that are kind of vague. Given a box of toys, you tell them, pick up the toy that is extinct, right? They'll pick up the dinosaur so they kind of can understand those vague instructions. You tell it, hey, what could we use to improvise a hammer? It'll pick up a rock. And all of this is happening just in the last year or so between NVIDIA and Eureka, Google DeepMind, Stanford, and the mobile Aloha. It really feels like things are accelerating fast. And here's the hardware guide for how to set up your very own Aloha robot. Mounting the cameras, shoulder joints, elbow joints, wrist, power cable connections, 3D printed wheels, how to hook it up to the odometer to make sure it knows how fast it's going, etc. Here they share the data sets in Google Drive. This is GitHub. I believe this is all the hardware code that you would need to install this on the, on the computer running the robot. And it's all spelled out here, what commands to run, what software to install. And finally, they have the learning code. So imitation learning algorithms and code training for mobile Aloha. And of course, they also have a blooper reel, just in case you were wondering. Here are the mobile Aloha failures. Now that I think about it, ooh, that's not a good idea. Grabbing, I assume, a hot pan. I can see how this could really go off tracks. I mean, can you imagine that thing having like the heated oil in there and accidentally like just chucking it over your shoulder. At the beginning of this video, I said, I'm not too worried about, you know, the safety of this thing, because if it goes rogue, I could just walk upstairs and it's not going to be able to follow me. But you know what? Seeing these bloopers, I take that back. This thing could do some damage if it goes rogue. But either way, what a time to be alive, as they say. Let me know what you think. If you were given one of these things, let's say somebody paid the $32,000 price tag and you were given one of those things, you know, to either set up yourself or somebody helped you assemble it and you were in charge of sort of training it to do various tasks around your house, like cleaning the bathroom or doing laundry or cooking something, would you try to automate as many of your tasks around the house as you could? If you live in a colder climate, shoveling the driveway, something like that. I'm really curious to know. Also, on a sort of unrelated note, I am launching a second channel. I've recruited someone to help me. I'll link that new channel down below. It's brand new, not a lot of subscribers. And it's going to have just your kind of daily dose of AI news in a rapid fire fashion. If you enjoy what I do here, if you want to help us out and you want kind of a rapid style AI news just to keep keep up with all the things that are happening, check out that other channel. It's called Natural 20. I'll leave a link in the description in the comment section below. You know, if you want to help us out, subscribe for that channel, maybe click on a video and just let it run or watch it if you're interested. Hit thumbs up, stuff like that. That helps us kind of get that channel running. New channels are hard to spin up on YouTube sometimes. So if you've enjoyed this stuff, if you want to help out, that'll be an excellent way to help us out. Our mission is to bring AI understanding to as many people as possible. There's a lot of, what do you even call it, misinformation out there. There's a lot of doomerism about AI and stuff like that. And I think while there are risks that we should be careful with, there are a lot of things that will, I think, solve a lot of humanity's problems. It can help us with dangerous jobs, with labor in general, can create prosperity. And of course, if it falls in the wrong hands, it can do a lot of damage. I haven't talked about too much about the mission of this channel, but, and don't worry, this is not going to get political. I'm not going to try to convince you of anything. My goal here is simply to present the truth of AI as much as possible. 
to make it easily accessible and easily understood for everyone. And so that's my goal in this channel, first and foremost, is to just get that information out there for everybody with no political lean, no brainwashing, no angles or whatever, trying to be unbiased. And most importantly, just clear and honest without any, without any intention to deceive. Now, there's a lot of people in the comments sometimes they'll say, oh, you said this, or you said that, that maybe it's not true, or it's overhyped, or it's clickbait. The reality is I get excited about this stuff. So sometimes some piece of news comes out and I'll create a video about it that's hyped up. Or for example, you know, when we don't know what's happening, but people are speculating online, I'll cover that as well. But I always try to label everything with exactly what it is. If we know something to be true, I'll say, we know this to be true. If it's speculation, I'll say, hey, this is speculation. This is hearsay. These are just rumors. But the goal here is to get this information out there. Every once in a while, I'll be wrong and I'll try to post corrections. Every once in a while, I'll hype something up and then we find out that maybe it might have been a little bit too overhyped and maybe we have to pull it back a little bit. But here's my promise to you is I'm never going to try to present something in a way that's misleading. I'm not going to try to say something in a way that benefits me. To the best of my ability, I'll try to present things as honestly as possible, which I think right now, unfortunately, there are people with, with a lot of reach and with a lot of control of the media or a lot of a large audience that maybe are a little bit more interested in pushing their agenda than necessarily explaining AI in the right way. So that's, that's my goal. That's my mission. That's what I'm here for. AI is very important. The tagline of the Natural 20 channel is, how often does AGI come around? How often do we get to witness this thing emerging? It's a very important time to be alive. All that is to say that if you've been with me for this journey, I really appreciate you. I think you are important. I think this is important. I'm not blowing smoke. I really do think that this is kind of a crucial time for the world. And I just want to do my part, no matter how small, in trying to guide this whole thing in the, in the right direction. And I appreciate you being here with me. As I've said before, I think the long-term future is very bright. In the short term, well, things might get a little bit bumpy and we have to be ready for that. With all that said, thank you for watching. If you want to help out, check out Natural 20. We just started it. Click subscribe, watch a few videos that really helps out. And if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth and I'll see you next time.